Well, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. We are here to tell you a historical detective story focusing on one of the most famous buildings in the world. Here you see the Houses of Parliament, officially still known as the Palace of Westminster, as rebuilt in the 1840s. Now, the reason for that rebuilding of Parliament was a devastating fire which had swept away most of the old palace of Westminster in 1834. When that fire took hold, huge crowds gathered to watch. Silhouetted in the flames was the magnificent Royal Chapel of St. Stephen, one of the glories of 14th century England, and currently the subject of a major interdisciplinary project funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council here at York in formal partnership with the UK Parliament. <coughs> Look deep within the Houses of Parliament and evidence of that old pre-fire Palace of Westminster can still be found. A cloister dating from Henry VIII's reign, dripping with Tudor royal iconography, today serves as desk space for the opposition whips. The upper range of that cloister provides an office for the sergeant at arms. Now neither of these spaces is regularly seen by visitors to Parliament. And as Tim and I have discovered, even some MPs have never seen the cloister. Why do these medieval architectural fragments matter so much? Because this isn't just any royal palace. This is the Palace of Westminster, the seat of royal power and English law, and crucially, the place where Parliament met. St Stephen's Chapel Westminster was one of the most splendid ecclesiastical buildings of its day, decorated to celebrate the victories of Edward III, but it also enjoyed an afterlife of unique political significance, and this is the crunch for us. In 1547, as a result of the Reformation started by Henry VIII, St Stephen's was dissolved as a place of worship and refurbished as a meeting place for the House of Commons. Now, MPs had gathered at Westminster since Chaucer's day, but only ever in borrowed space this was the first time in history that the Commons acquired a debating chamber of its own, modified for its exclusive use. By studying this one architectural footprint, we are able to trace the transition from sacred royal power through to modern parliamentary democracy. Well, to help you visualise where St Stephen's was and is, here's a ground plan of the palace as rebuilt by the Victorians, rather complicated. The space that Tim and I are talking about is here. That is St Stephen's Chapel in the medieval palace, the House of Commons between 1547 and 1834, now known as St Stephen's Hall, if you've ever visited the Palace of Westminster. And that space highlighted in blue, just there, is St Stephen's Cloister. As I said, this isn't an easy part of the Palace of Westminster to access. But if you were to find a friendly member of the House of Lords to let you in, then you could see this amazing space. This is the Undercroft Chapel of St Mary. Now this was the lower chapel of the medieval Palace of Westminster, and it's a royal space even today. When we wanted to hold a concert of music composed for St Stephen's back on site for the first time since the Reformation, I found myself negotiating with Black Rod, who represents the power of the sovereign in Parliament. Fortunately, Black Rod is a singer, uh, so the concert went ahead and it will soon be available on our website. Now, the sheer height of St Stephen's Chapel, the magnificent proportions, are clearly visible in this engraving dating from 1647. And St Stephen's, as the House of Commons, is here on the left-hand side of this image. Now, this image comes courtesy um, of the Parliamentary Art Collection, which is a fantastic resource for us. And what excites us particularly is the caption there, Parliament House. Now, we think that this is proof that St Stephen's Chapel had become emblematic by this period of the idea of Parliament. And not only the idea of Parliament, but the growing power of the Commons over the House of Lords. Now, this is one of my favourites. This next painting depicts the Palace of Westminster soon after the 1834 fire. 
Now, so soon after, in fact, if you look in St Stephen's Cloister here, there is still a hand-pumped fire engine um, that has recently been putting out the flames. And St Stephen's is on the right. I think this is just such a poignant image because it shows how much of the chapel actually survived the 1834 fire, only to be pulled down to make way for the new Victorian Gothic palace. We dearly like to know where that stonework went. Uh, some of it probably disappeared under the London Embankment. Our project focuses on St Stephen's Chapel in successive phases, as a place of worship in the medieval period, as the theatre of parliamentary debate in the early modern period, and finally as the ceremonial gateway to Parliament, which is the function it still serves today, across a span of seven centuries. Now, as we research this space, we are also reconstructing it virtually in a series of 3D models, which will ultimately be displayed to the public, as well as shared with academics. And Tim will now explain how we're building those models. Thanks very much indeed, uh, John. As you've been hearing, our project is a kind of biography of a single building. So it's been essential for us to understand uh, its changing physical form, and virtual reconstruction is a great way to do that. So the whole project team has been involved, working closely with the Centre for the Study of Christianity and Culture here at York. And you're looking at our first draft reconstruction of the exterior of the two-storey medieval chapel. Our first public viewing of how it may have looked in the reign of Edward III around the year uh, 1360. This was the place of worship for the English royal family and their household, and uh, where they were prayed for in turn by a community of clergy. The chapel stood at the very heart of the medieval palace, as it still stands at the heart of the, the palace today, as John's just shown us. This block model here um, shows the site uh, in the early 16th century. Familiar landmarks help us to get our bearings. You can see Westminster Abbey in the background here and the long roof slope of Westminster Hall. This is St Stephen's here, between uh, the hall and the royal apartments to the south running along um, the riverbank. By the 13th century already, Westminster was a favoured royal residence and becoming the central site for the government of the kingdom. Our researchers have been looking at the place of the chapel in late medieval politics and government, in the history of the church and church music, and the royal patronage of art and architecture. And in many of these, the visualisation of the chapel and the spaces um, and its spaces um, have played an important uh, part. The medieval building uh, may be largely lost, but the sources for studying and reconstructing it are extremely rich. The most important are the 14th century building accounts preserved today in the National Archives at Kew. And we're looking here at just one little section. But a related uh, project funded by the Leverhulme Trust has allowed us to transcribe and translate over 60 of these account rolls. They record the thousands of people involved, their pay and the materials that they used week by week over more than half a century. Quite simply, these are among the richest records for any medieval building in Europe, and we're going to be publishing them shortly in an edition that currently weighs in at about half a million words. <coughs> um, the bit we're looking at here um, records materials for painting the upper chapel at St Stephen's in June 1352, and as you can see, it ranges from pig bristles for brushes to expensive vermilion and gold leaf. Vast quantities of gold leaf were bought, over 70,000 foils in 1351-52 to 52 alone. So, from the mundane to the magnificent. 
Accounts like this have undermined uh, the making of our model, but we've also been doing detective work with visual sources. And taken together, these sources have proved particularly exciting in recreating the colour of the building. Paintings in the Society of Antiquaries in London, like the one that you can see at the top here, allowed us to put the uh, pigments um, mentioned in the accounts into their rightful places. So the blue arrow um, shows you the spot um, that um, this picture records. And these watercolours were made in the 1790s, at the point when the medieval fabric of St Stephen's was first rediscovered um, behind the panelling of the House of Commons. We've also studied surviving pieces of painted stonework from the chapel, like the frieze, which you can see at the bottom here in the British Museum. And paint specialists confirmed that the pigments on this fragment were the same as the ones in the accounts. And they helped us to understand what they would have looked like um, when they were fresh and new. These sources have allowed us to clothe an architectural skeleton to give an authentic impression of the aesthetic experience of the 14th century chapel for the very first time since the Middle Ages. And as you can see, it was a building of staggering opulence, brilliant in colour and highly reflective in gold leaf. Filled with royal heraldry and the favourite saints of King Edward III, this was a magnificent royal building. So the model allows us to visualise and also to present the ways in which St Stephen's rivalled great palace chapels on the continent from Paris to Prague. But the model is doing much more than that. As you've already heard, the building's life story took a dramatic turn in the Tudor period when the chapel was repurposed as the House of Commons. And for that, let me hand you back to John. So far as we know, there was no grand plan to create a new mating place for the House of Commons in 1547. It was just an accident of Tudor history. The Commons needed a place to meet. Here was St Stephen's Chapel, prime real estate, lying vacant in the middle of the Palace of Westminster because of the Reformation. But the consequences, we think, of that decision to move the Commons into St Stephen's were profound. For the next three centuries, the Commons gathered debated, legislated, bickered, petitioned, and were lobbied in a space which had formerly been a royal chapel. Now here we see the royal chapel refurbished as Commons Chamber by Sir Christopher Wren. It looks orderly and decorous, doesn't it? It looks the very model of sort of enlightenment civility. But the truth we know was very different. It was noisy, airless, badly lit, and it was also way too crowded. So crowded, in fact, that not every MP could get into the space and sit down at the same time. Now, how many MPs could actually fit into this space? This is one of the problems, believe it or not, that we are using our digital model to resolve. The question is, how much space should we allow for each MP's bottom? <laughs> Initially, we went for 50 centimetres per political posterior but we may have to reduce that to 35 centimetres to get more members into the space. Now, you in this room are amongst the very first people to see this. This was modelled uh, shortly before Christmas. Um, this is our digital reconstruction of the Commons Chamber, complete with the green cushions and the cloth on the clerk's table, you can see here, um, that mark it out as Commons space rather than Lord's space. This is the first 3D model of the historic House of Commons. And we expect it to generate a lot of impact. But the model, as Tim said, is more than that. It's a means of explaining ourselves to the public, but it's also focusing our research questions within the project. And I'll end by giving you just one example of that. When you model the House of Commons in three dimensions, you can immediately appreciate just how cramped a space it was for the more than 500, even 600 MPs who sat in it. As a performance space, the Commons was very intimate. In fact, an Elizabethan MP described it as a kind of theatre. Over time, the close and crowded atmosphere 
became central to the identity of the Commons. Winston Churchill spoke against plans to enlarge the House of Commons chamber precisely so that there should be on great occasions a sense of crowd and urgency. So we have an accident of history, the conversion of St Stephen's Chapel into the House of Commons, becoming a defining feature of the British political experience. Churchill got his way. The House of Commons is still too small. Thank you.